your veins. Mackie and Judd on Score North and scorenorth.com. The fact that it even got to that and that it get, this is what we see in the highlights, like, oh, the Vikings win. The Vikings were up 16-6 to six with three minutes left, and they had a missed field goal, and their running back fumbled unnecessarily. Like, they tried giving this game away, and it's a team that has already given away other games. <laughs> The Vikings are 2-3. and three. They could very easily be 5-0 and oh right now. They have been that good. I am crying for the Lions fans. Obviously, there's some tragic losses to them. I'm crying for Vikings fans. It's got to be a heart attack every Peter, Sunday. You're working up a lather over just there. After these games, like, just, just take a knee, dude. Oh, unbelievable. <laughs> oh, man. Peter, that was the Good Morning Football crew, Peter Schrager. Peter Schrager saying the Vikings should be 5-0 and oh right now. Um... We're going to get into, well, we'll react to him in a second, um, but Pro Football Focus had a really interesting discussion about sort of the state of the Vikings that we'll get into, but uh, this is Mackie and Judd, daily Minnesota sports entertainment and therapy. Got the wild season about to start, Wolves season about to start here, Vikings going into uh, Carolina, but what did you think of Peter Schrager's vouching for the Vikings, saying, hey, you guys, this is a way better team than two and three indicates. I think he hasn't watched the games. Um, <laughs> I think if you watch the games, yes, it could go. I'm not saying it couldn't go a game um, or two, perhaps, the other way in some ways. Uh, but let's look at Cleveland. They lost that game. They deserve to. They deserve to. The Bengals game. Don't give me the second half comeback. The Cook Fumble, yes, those things hurt. That first half was egregious. You were unprepared for the first half of your season opener? Come on. Cardinals game was tough. Cardinals game was tough. But the Detroit game, I would argue they should have won the Cardinals game and lost the Lions game because they completely collapsed. I, I And that was all on them. So I think it's very simple to look at records and, sp and, and spreads. And spreads are tough because... You, you look at the end of a game and you're like, oh, they lost by four. They lost by seven. And you're, oh, it's so close. And that might be true. But how did you get there? The eye test. So I do not think that the Vikings, I, I would not agree at all that, oh, just a thing here or, or there. As Patrick said on Unchained Monday, they aren't as good of a team as I thought. Doesn't mean they don't have some really good players. But as far as like maximizing your capabilities to win football games, yeah, five and oh. Not even close to me. Also, I think it's really easy if if a team – we did this with the Twins early in the season, right? Not necessarily we. I think we saw, we saw the fatal flaws in the Twins on this show. Uh, but maybe, maybe not. I was probably on the bandwagon still. But, like, when teams lose close games, it's like, oh, look how unlucky they are. Oh, my gosh. Like, what bad luck to have lost seven – uh, extra innings games in a row to start the season, you know, Dick Bramer, just apoplectic. Like, <laughs> I mean, there's some bad luck. The Dalvin Cook fumble was, I thought that was a bad call against the Bengals. That was probably bad luck. You know, now, did you miss a bunch of opportunities that could have put you up further in that game and maybe you didn't have to grind it out toward the end? Yeah, right? Uh, a kicker missing a kick that hasn't really kicked in the regular season for three years. That's not really bad luck. That's sort of self-inflicted, right? It's Vikings history of bad kickers, and you rolled the dice with Greg Joseph. So sure. I'm, you know, there, there's definitely a little bit of bad luck here, and they probably should have three, maybe four wins, but there's a lot of self-inflicted stuff here. Uh, Declan found this note that the Vikings have the toughest remaining schedule in the NFL going forward, according to <laughs> tankathon.com. And the, in the easiest one in the next... The yeah, the easiest game in the next month and a half is probably a road game at Carolina against one of the best defenses in the NFC. So um, PFF, Declan flagged this a few weeks ago, and we didn't get to it then, but I think it's even more relevant now than it may have been a few weeks ago. PFF Sam, who's been a friend of our show in Score North, um, and then who is it PFF Steve with the slick yeah, back Steve. curly hair, big tall guy, yeah. scout guy? So they did a 30-minute podcast, and the whole thing was about how the Vikings can get out of NFL purgatory. And their main points on the podcast were that the Vikings are always too good to draft in the top five and really, like, not that all top five quarterbacks are panning out, but, like, they're always too good to be in a position to draft the young franchise quarterback. 
but they're not good enough ever to win a Super Bowl, right? Like they're always kind of on the fringe of the playoffs. And and then they highlighted the fact that going into 2022, you're paying your quarterback and Harrison Smith about 25% of your salary cap, and both those guys are well over the age of 30. And the quote that stood out to me was when PFF Sam said, what is your goal as a franchise? Is it championship or is it to make the playoffs and keep your jobs? That instead of always asking, how can this team make the playoffs? You should ask, what is the likeliest outcome based on your roster construction and the division and the way the NFL is going? So is it fair to say that the Vikings, who are 2-3, and three, hardest schedule left in the NFL, probably on another crash course with a 500-ish record, right? I mean, it's it's hard to envision them like rolling off nine straight wins or something sure. with the schedule. Is it fair to say that the Vikings are in NFL, quote, purgatory? Yes, it's very fair to say that. But um, the thing about it is it's self-inflicted completely. And here's the problem. The three of us on this show might not like that. Like we're like our goal as we have what started stating a year ago is for for the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before we die. And and in particular, that means me because I'm old. Um, and so <laughs> I, I mean, you know, I have high cholesterol. So yeah, yeah, you do. But I mean, I might keel at some point here. I have I a heart issue. It's a whole thing. Yeah, yeah Declan like almost got, died in Colorado a, a couple of years ago. I had a heart, heart attack a couple of years ago. Yeah, I'm only 25. Dex, I'm guessing yeah. you've got, I'm guessing you've got 23 years left or so. Okay. Yeah. So like family yeah. history, my yeah. family history says so too. So yeah. yes, I, I, yeah, I, I think you get to 50. I, I'm going to say you get to 53 years. Over under 55 and a half. I'm taking the under. Oh, under for sure. Purple yeah. props on Friday. All Purple right, let's props. just do a bunch of Declan's cryptic Declan predictions. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, like I've got good genes. Declan doesn't. No. But I mean, I'm still older no. now, and so I'm, you know, going to be what 52 next month. So, but my point is this: let's go. Let's forget about what the Vikings' philosophy is from a coaching and um, front office standpoint, or executive standpoint. Ownership. I don't think ownership understands the difference between Super Bowl aspirations. And just being good, because I think in, in the Wilf's mind and until it's changed, what they have sort of created is a culture of if we make the playoffs, it, it's it's actually the hockey thing. If we make the playoffs, yeah, you never know. And like there have been examples. So like they can cite chapter and verse of but those teams were positioned differently at times. That was in in a lot of cases now a different era of football so my point is i think that the purgatory is self-inflicted because they don't see it as purgatory they see it as we're consistently competitive and one of these damn years we're going to make the playoffs and get on a roll and make a run and that's the danger that's the disconnect between uh, uh phil declan and judd and the wilfs i think yeah because from a business standpoint they're not in purgatory at all right correct they're printing money at the new stadium your people are buying twelve dollar beers or or whatever it is, and I think, I think they're like very solidly in the middle of the pack in terms of revenue. I mean, they're not like they're not the Dallas Cowboys or some of the top top the New York Giants, the big market franchises. But like from a business standpoint, they would say we're not in purgatory. In fact, it's actually good for business to always be right on the cusp of playoffs because not only are you keeping people's interest through the month of December and sometimes into January. Mm-hmm. You're also keep holding people's interest in the off season because oh, what can they add to get this piece or to get this team over the top? And and then when they sort of teeter on, you know, not being good enough to make the playoffs, there's still there's temporary outrage that people feel, and so people always feel a passion toward the team yes. when you're sitting around seven, eight, nine, ten wins. Occasionally, they'll go beyond the ten wins. So there's there's from a business standpoint, they're not in purgatory. And that's probably where the Wilfs are coming from. Hey, if, let's just be competitive every year, and then one of these years it'll pop and we'll win a Super Bowl like the Giants in 2007 or something. Um, but if your goal is to do everything you can from a roster standpoint, salary cap, drafting, everything, you are in purgatory. And I actually went back. I was kind of curious. I was just, you know, what what does a Super Bowl winning team look like? In terms of like, what are the prerequisites that you need? And we've and we've talked before about 
well, if you have Tom Brady, you're going to just go to the Super Bowl every year. So that's like get a Tom Brady is not realistic. Um, quarterback on a rookie scale contract is something that pops up regularly for teams that go to and win the Super Bowl. But here's another one. Since 1990, 28 of 32 Super Bowl winning teams have finished the regular season at least 11 and 5. So going back to 1990, before Declan was born, and when I was like five years old and getting my first Tecmo Super Bowl Nintendo game. Life was good. Life was great. <laughs> For Phil. <laughs> Dex didn't know life yet. I was playing with uh, QB Eagles on Tecmo Super Bowl for I Nintendo. Was pounding beers. Jeb was pounding beers. Jeb was drinking. Um, so since 1990, 90% of the Super Bowl winning teams, all but four of them, mm-hmm. won at least 11 games in the regular season. Mm-hmm. And by the way, the only four teams that don't fall into that category, uh, the Ravens in 2012, who just got white hot Joe Flacco for four and, games yeah. in the playoffs. Yep. Great oh, yeah. coach, great defense. Mm-hmm. You can do it, but they went on the road three times and then went to the Super Bowl, right? The Giants twice in 07 and 11, same thing. Eli gets red hot. And then the Packers in 2010 actually went 10 and 6. They had one of the greatest mm-hmm. quarterbacks of all time, Aaron Rodgers. But 11 and 5 is the benchmark for regular season success the last 30 plus years in the NFL if you want to win a Super Bowl. The Vikings over the last 20 seasons almost never go 11 and 5. It's happened three times. It happened in 2009 with Brett Favre. And it happened uh, twice, actually, under Mike Zimmer when they went 11 and five, and and the Blair Walsh miss against Seattle in the playoffs, and then the 13 and three Case Keenum year. And so, like we talk about, can you sneak in? And generally, you can't just sneak in with eight, nine, or ten wins, and then cross your fingers and pray. It has happened, but you need to build your team, offense, maximize the upside of your team, play calling, everything. Mm-hmm. to get 11, 12, 13 wins in the regular season because that's how you get home games in the playoffs. That's how you get a bye in the first round and just get to skip around entirely, right? And so, like, you look at how many times the Vikings have finished with seven, eight, or nine wins over that stretch, and it's almost every other year they finish with seven, eight, or nine wins. Sometimes they'll hit, hit you with 10, right? Right. But that's the thing. It's like it's. like I'll say it again. It's a gravitational pull toward eight or nine wins, which is good enough to be competitive, and good enough to bring in revenue and mm-hmm. fill the seats, mm-hmm. but it's not good enough to win a Super Bowl. It's purgatory. The problem is, and what also keeps you here to a large extent is this: the Wilfs, and this is a this is a credit and a demerit at the same time. The Wilfs are more than happy to allow you to go to the grocery store with a big checkbook or or a big bank account. Go spend as much as you want. Yeah, of course, of course. Get the ingredients. Great. But they don't necessarily hire the right chefs, and I don't know that they have the ability. And this this is now a a, a continuing pattern. I don't know that they have the ability to identify those people. Like, I mean, Spielman re- replaced Fran Foley in two thousand and six when that was a debacle after a few months, and he's been here since. And it's like they like him. And then Zim comes in. I am going to tell you that I think there the list of, of teams that didn't win win 11 games phil that you went through where there's a real problem here too those two giants teams are a major problem taking you behind the curtain i can't articulate enough how much the wolves loved the giants as kids how much they respect them as adults like what their culture was how they built and i know in the 70s uh before parcels then they stunk but they have so much respect for what the Giants did, and they are, and they were for so long so devoted to that team that I think they looked at that blueprint and said, "Why not us?" Yeah, and I'm going to tell you right now, I still contend it thrills them that at the drop of a hat, Zim calls or gets a call from Parcells, and that Bill Parcells is calling, and that, and that this is how the Giants did things, and this is what yeah. the greatest that the probably the greatest coach in their mind in football. Bill Parcells, what he thinks. And so I really believe that all of these things go into the the fact that the Vikings are almost content at very important um, uh, pieces of this franchise with being 
mediocre, but hoping and, and actually doing things that should allow you to jump up because like Kirk Cousins was supposed to like the, like you can't say, well, the Wilfs are also cheap. They, they don't invest. No, they do invest, but are they having the right people in, invest? And so here, here's a question. Do you think that they can see through the fact that now years into the working relationship between Zim and Spielman, that it probably doesn't really work well? Like, like you've got a guy that went out and signed Kirk, which, okay, you're all in. That's awesome. But, but around the same time, approximately like a month before that, the head coach said, don't do that. Like, it's very clear. I think it's, uh, I, th- I think to your, it really crystallized for me when you, when you brought up Spielman. I mean, when you lay it out like that and say, yeah, they got rid of Fran Foley after a rough few months, like their first year as being owners. And then they brought Rick Spielman in and he wasn't the general manager but he was he was the de facto head of the front office, right? And then he became the general manager like six right. years later. I mean, he's been the guy in that front office for fifteen years. Correct. And they've only been a train wreck like twice, and they've quickly recovered and became playoff team again. And it's I, I think of some of these game shows like Who Wants to Be a Millionaire or uh, what's the one with the the briefcases and Howie Mandel fist bumping everybody, where you've got like with Who Wants to Be a Millionaire, you get these different levels, and it's like. Boy, I've got I've got twenty five thousand dollars guaranteed right now. I mean, I could I could use some lifelines and try and say, well, no, the goal is to win a million dollars, right? And so you right. to get there, you you might have to risk the fifty or the one fifty you have in hand or the two fifty to get that to go to that next level. But and I think by the way, on who wants to be a millionaire, most people would be like, I'm not going to risk two hundred fifty thousand dollars for a shot at a million. I'm I very comfortable. Yeah. with $250,000. And I wouldn't blame people for doing that. But when your franchise has never won the million dollars, you've been playing Who Wants to Be a Millionaire for 60 years. You've won the 50,000. You've won the 250. You've won the 500,000. Mm-hmm. You've never won the million. Mm-hmm. Take a risk. If you, if you think Mike Zimmer is good, not great, take a risk. Well, what if, you know, Kirk Cousins, good, not great. Well, what if we draft another Christian Ponder? Well, if you want to get a great quarterback, that's not the ninth best guy or the twelfth best guy, but the third best guy. That's another thing. I I almost question from ownership all the way down to even like some fans, like and myself watching this team for thirty five years. Do you feel like you deserve, or at some point, um, are entitled to a Super Bowl or greatness? I almost feel like we don't in this town. Where it's just like we've just sort of resigned to the fact that, well, I mean, we're never going to win a Super Bowl, so why would you want to give up nine and seven? You know, it could be right. worse. Well, it could be the Jets for twenty years. I agree completely, and we also, as sports fans, not not just the Vikings, but I think as the grand sports fans in this town, we don't feel that we deserve it, and we don't even know what it looks like. So, like, like I mean, when's the last time that you seriously started a year? And, and I don't mean hoping. I mean, you started a year with a hubris about you, about this team is going to win a championship. Because there are towns in which that happens. Not saying I'm all, that, that that's true across the board, but when's yeah. the last time that the Vikings kicked off and you said, you know what? Honestly, Realistically, Super Bowl or bust. Here's the crazy thing. You're, you're saying at the start of the season? Yeah, I'm saying where my, you had the hubris, the confidence, never. the arrogance. Never. Never. Okay. Well, people are going to say, well, what about the Brett Favre season? We didn't know. That guy threw 20 picks with the Jets the, the previous year. And the first two games, he was not good in 2009. So at the start of the 09 season, it was exciting. It's like, oh, Brett Favre. But is he cooked? I don't know. Let's watch him for a couple games. Browns, Lions, right? They just handed off to Peterson for a couple weeks. And then they were getting trounced in that Niners game in week three. And then all of a sudden, he makes the throw to Greg Lewis. And okay, they start to win more games. The 98 season, they drafted Randy Moss, and they looked really good in the preseason, but I don't think anyone thought no, no going way. into that season that they were going to be the greatest offense in NFL history in 15-1. and There wasn't like a hubris going into that. Now, as as they started 4-0, and 5-0, and and they're putting up 40 points, and Randy Moss is Randy Moss, then the, then the hubris grew to an all-time peak, mm-hmm. and then everybody was cut down by the Falcons. So outside of those two seasons, I can't think of any year in which – I felt like, yep, this is 
It's the way the Bills fans feel going into this year, right? It's the way that the Buccaneers fans, Chiefs fans, have felt the last couple of years. Chiefs fans, it might not be true now, but in the face, yeah. But you feel that okay? We we've got the quarterback, we've got the coach, we've got a team. We are going to be great. Yep. Almost every year of Vikings football in my existence, without many exceptions at all, for thirty plus years, the beginning of the season feeling is, I think it's a playoff team. I think it's a playoff team. Yeah. Correct. Pretty sure, pr- pretty, sh- yeah, pretty sure it's a playoff team, but the schedule's kind of tough. I don't know. Like, and do you think? Do you think Chiefs fans right. do the schedule thing at the beginning of the year right now, where they're like, "Oh my God, look at that tough four game stretch." Now they're like, "Oh, we're going to beat everyone." <laughs> we're the Chiefs. We are. They're, perpe- they're not, but we are perpetually prepared for Lucy to pull the football out on, on us, and we, we as people who are Vikings fans and follow this team, are one thousand percent Charlie Brown. Like we're waiting, but because when we say, you know what, this Vikings team is pretty good, there's always the qualifier of, yeah, but someone's going to miss a field goal. Something's going to go wrong. There's always that qualifier. This is why I think that, that there is a large portion of a very damaged fan base here that gets so defensive about the team. I, if this team ever won a Super Bowl and went on a run where you just said, damn it, they are real, oh man, three years in a row, this team's great. Uh, I really think a lot of, those fans, their their attitude would change and demeanor because then they would expect greatness. When you don't know how to expect greatness, I think you jump on the old, well, I mean, it's the Vikings that I mean, they're trying hard. Like You're all negative because, you know, that's I think we get that from the portion that we don't have any way to identify the Vikings and greatness. I at times feel like teams in, in this town don't belong to leagues that have championships. You mean like like the, like the wolves, the, twins, the yeah, wolves, like, and the like, Larry O'Brien Trophy yeah, are so far estranged. The Lombardi <laughs> Trophy and the Vikings, like I, that, that's why I say I, I partially want the Vikings to win a Super Bowl before I die because I want to know what it looks like. I know, like it's crazy. Like what it's does crazy. it look like? Like I can't even. It's nuts. I can identify the Green Bay Packers Super Bowl champions. Uh, mm-hmm. No problem. Seen it before, right? Dude, here's the other crazy thing. So we can see, you know, this doesn't really matter to the audience, but like. On our YouTube channel and with with our podcast feeds, like we can see that over the last couple of years, especially with Score North, Mackie and Judd and Purple Daily, the biggest chunk of our audience is 25 to 34. None of those people have ever seen consciously, like you might have been three years old in 1991 or four or something, sure. but none of those people, the biggest yeah. chunk of our audience on Mackie and Judd and Purple Daily have never seen a Vikings Wild slash North Stars, Wolves, or Twins championship. They're Declan. The Lynx gave you four. Or Minnesota United, obviously. Yeah, it's Declan. And, and, and I was born in 85. I vaguely remember like going to school after Kirby Puckett hit the game six home run and the teacher, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Fish, putting the newspaper clippings up on the wall. Like I have vague memories of that as a six-year-old. And I'm 36. Mm-hmm. Anyone who's basically under the age of 40 has very little to no conscious memories of the four major men's sports teams being championship caliber. Think about that. It doesn't mean, well, it's never going to happen. No, it, it will happen. It will happen. And I do believe if fans and media, not that we are like pulling the strings or anything, but like if we get complacent and we get comfortable with mediocrity or just being good enough, ownership then feels it and gets comfortable. You know, Jim Polab might be aloof, but you think that that Twins ownership group, when they made, like when they signed Ricky Nolasco, that was a terrible signing. But they signed Ricky Nolasco because they felt guilty not spending money after a couple of years of people criticizing them. You might laugh at that, but like they looked around and said, "I guess we uh, all right. We got to spend forty million dollars on someone here because we just opened this stadium and people are going to riot." It was a bad signing, yeah. but like to say that fans and media have no influence. That's not true. You're not going to pull the strings, but to be complacent is feeding into the idea that these teams are never going to win championships and stay in purgatory. And the problem too is is that, and this is probably, this is probably more exclusively to the Vikings, but the problem too is there's just far too many people in, in this town, including some who work in our end of the business who are very happy with what they're doing. And so the Wilfs, if you go through, if you go through the people that own teams in this town, okay, I can give you a very easy list of of those who would be influenced by by fans and people in our end of the business, 
and those who wouldn't. Jim Polat is sort of, but he is, to, to use the word that you just did, Phil, aloof. Like Very he's aloof. a really aloof. So you would really need to ride Jim Polat. A Polad. plus front yeah. office. He does Great it. Great yeah. job, guys. He's, for the most part, Jim Jim's like, I own a baseball team, and it's great, and okay. Glenn Taylor, we've talked about Glenn quite a bit. Um, but, I mean, Glenn, again, pretty aloof to, to the world. He, I, I don't think he really gets it. Mm -hmm. um, Leopold and the Wilfs, if they got serious pushback, would react. They would react. And, like, if the Wil if if this town turned into a, what the hell? You guys are, you know, winning nine and ten games? We won a damn Super Bowl. If everybody like like sort of came to our side, like if people who were on different sports uh, stations across the board, if they're if they said we need to actually put pressure on the people that own this team to know that they need to take the next step or three, the Wilfs would react. I know them. I can yeah. tell you for sure. But when you get this continual uh, attaboy, you beat the Lions, you go, a win is a win. A win is a win. That's why that type of crap is so detrimental. Like you are allowing everybody off the hook instead of, of saying our standards are far higher than a win is a win against the Detroit Lions. Yeah. Now, I don't want to go too far with that because you get then you get teams like, like the Jets and the Mets in New York have such – big rabbit ears and the ownership that they'll the jets are like oh you sure you have tim okay we'll sign tim tebow like you know they'll just they'll just do what the fans want right, them to do I just want as opposed to making smart moves shrewd moves i just want a standard we don't have good enough standards i agree with that i just want a standard i don't we do. want we to have do very low things. sports standards we do but or I mean, at least we have we have very uh I don't know if mediocre. We we just have, like the bar is too low. Like we just oh man, let's, let's make we're the We're happy playoffs. to be here. Yeah, we're happy great. to be here. Yep. That's what it is. Right. We're we're always we're just we're we're classically happy to be here. We're passive and, aggressive. Yeah. And you're you're exactly right, Declan. That's a perfect way to put it. Yeah. it and it, it's it's incredibly frustrating because I think every team has its own little warts. Like yeah, the Bi Vikings and Wild are kind of looped together because they're usually drafting fifteenth or sixteenth. Or in the Wild side, they traded away a boatload of picks in the last decade, or they didn't hit. Or the Vikings have a boatload of first round picks and the majority of them don't hit. And then you get stuck in that classic area when the Wolves, you have teams that have or you have that team that has classically drafted in the top five for like the last fifteen years and you still have stunk because of poor ownership and poor general managing. It is it's it's a classic circle, a vicious circle that we just get trapped into every year. And, yeah. and I wish we could raise our expectations too. I've got a couple ideas, maybe on Purple Daily sometime this week or next. I've got a, a couple proposed paths out of purgatory for the Vikings, but I kind of want to see what they do against the Panthers first. If they win, then I'm back all in, baby. I was going right, to say, are you yeah. just going to be like, oh, man, this is great. What, what are you guys talking about? Nine wins, here we come. <laughs> all right, when are you guys going to admit that you were wrong? Coming up next. Write that down Wednesday here on Mackie and Judd.